Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am pleased to introduce our guests. Known for her testimony to the US House of Representatives during Donald Trump's 2019 impeachment hearings, Fiona Hill has more than 30 years of experience in foreign policy. The Robert Bosch Senior Fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe in the Foreign Policy Program at the Brookings Institution, she is a former National Security Council official and former officer at the National Intelligence Council. Hill is the co-author of Mr. Putin, Operative in the Kremlin, and The Siberian Curse, How Communist Planners Left Russia Out in the Cold. And she has written extensively on strategic issues related to Eastern Europe and Central Asia. In There Is Nothing For You Here, she traces her path as the daughter of a coal miner in Northern England to her service to three US presidents. Hill examines the desperation impacting American politics and shows why expanding opportunity is the only long-term hope for our democracy. Tonight, Ms. Hill will be in conversation with Trudy Rubin, Worldview columnist with the Philadelphia Inquirer and a longtime friend of the author event series. Trudy, Fiona, it's an honor to have you join us. The screen is yours. Thanks so much, Andy. Thanks so much, Andy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be doing this, uh, and it couldn't be more timely um, because this book, uh, There Is Nothing For You Here, goes from the personal in a coal town uh, to the political uh, in the White House and to the whole issue of populism and how we are all struggling to save democracy. Uh, and since you all know uh, about Fiona's testimony uh, in the impeachment over the Ukraine mess, it is interesting to see uh, that ex-President Trump still can't let go of uh, coming out against anyone who criticizes him and has uh, put together an outrageous statement about Fiona after the issuing of her book, but it does have a wonderful punchline, uh, which I think uh, will probably um, be used by Fiona in the future because it's funny, but it also speaks to some truth. It's uh, the ex-president said Fiona Hill was a deep state stiff with a nice accent. Well, that speaks to the whole issue about the conspiracy theory and the deep state, but it also speaks to a Northern Ireland accent that to find Fiona's origins, uh, her class status in England, and in a way shaped much of her life. Uh, so it makes me want to ask, why did you decide Fiona to shape this basically political memoir through the story of your growing up poor in a coal mining town with a father who had been thrown out of work by the closing of the pits. Well, it really started, Trudy, with my experience at the testimony, you know, two years ago. Um, in fact, uh, this month uh, was when the closed door depositions began you know, basically taking uh, witness testimony that would then go forward into the hearings in November for the first impeach impeachment trial. And I realized during the closed door hearings that there was an awful lot of hostility from supporters of the president toward the people like myself who'd been asked to come forward as fact witnesses. And they were all trying to impugn us, you know, attack our credibility, say things about us, and that whole line about us being deep state deep state coup plotters, people who were from some privileged elite, part of the swamp that President Trump had said that he wanted to clean up when he came into Washington, D.C., trying to sort of suggest that, you know, we were some nefarious grouping of, you know, exquisitely privileged people who had been born out of, you know, kind of, um, uh, it's even bizarre, I mean, to thought of, think about what they were trying to conjure up about us as we're sort of born into you know, these exalted statuses, you know, deep in the state. And I kind of, you know, sat back from all of this and thought, what are these people doing? Because, you know, Trump was purporting to be the president of the people. He had appealed throughout his campaign 
to the working class, to the blue collar workers of steelworks and shipyards and well, that's shipyards because I guess there's not so many left in the United States either. But anyway, coal mines and that was me. That was my family. You know, I grew up in the equivalent of the Lehigh Valley in Pennsylvania. In fact, many of my relatives moved over uh, to the United States to work in coal mines and others at different points. My father wanted to do that. And it really made me stop and pause. And when I actually put together my personal statement, my opening statement for the public hearings, because I hadn't had one for the uh, closed door deposition, I decided to just lay it all out at the beginning. I'm not some you know, bizarre member of some strange deep state behind the corridors action committee. I'm an ordinary person. I'm an immigrant to the United States. And I come from the very humble origins of the people that President Trump is purporting to represent. And so out of that testimony, and by laying that out at the very beginning, I got a huge number, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters. And they were all overwhelmingly positive, you know, with a few odd exceptions. It was on the internet that I got a lot of opprobrium. But all these letters, people had taken the time to write to me. And people wrote to me from Pennsylvania. They wrote to me from all around the country, basically saying, that story resonated with them. The story of my immigrant background and my father and grandfather and great grandfather had all been coal miners and how, you know, that sort of story of hard scrabble origins and, you know, professional success really resonated with them, you know, them as Americans and a lot of other people who were immigrants as well. And they said, you should write more about this. And so that's how I started to start this analysis of where we had got to in terms of the state of our democracy, the populism, the polarization that had brought us to that first impeachment and a second impeachment, you know, via the events of January 6th and the storming of the Capitol, which actually happened as I was already writing the book. I wanted to kind of explain how we got there, but use this personal through story because it had resonated so much with people. In fact, my personal story is the story of millions of people in America. And certainly, a vast majority of the population of Pennsylvania. Well, what's so interesting in your book is how you compare the origins of populism in the United States, in Britain, and in Russia, where you've spent a lot of time and built your career on studying. Um, and you show both the differences and the similarities that lead to this dangerous kind of populism. Uh, so in Britain, uh, the uh, factors that seem to hold people back in the areas that have become de-industrialized have to do more with location, class, and accent. Uh, President Trump didn't recognize that your accent is not the posh accent of the Oxbridge graduate, Oxbridge in Cambridge, uh, it's Northern England, which a Brit would recognize uh, immediately. So tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in a coal town that no longer had pits um, and, and uh, what that meant for someone like yourself who had aspirations. How could you get out of that situation? Well, first of all, you know, the education system was key in both sides of this equation, both in terms of downward mobility and upward mobility, because a lot of the education system had developed locally, as look, I'm sure is exactly the case for people of my generation growing up in the US, because I didn't grow up obviously in the US and I came to the US when I was already in my 20s for graduate school. But there was an expectation in the local schools that you were being prepared you know, particularly for a, a boy for a, a work down the pit, you know, up until the time when the coal mines start to close or in a local factory, a foundry. We had lots of manufacturing, you know, plants around, steelworks. And, you know, the, you, in a way, the education system was very similar for our parents, grandparents, and even great grandparents and some of the things that you were learning in the curriculum. And there was an expectation that you weren't going to stay on in school for any kind of further education or necessarily going to college unless you were going for skills training for an apprenticeship you know, a technical college for maybe engineering or something like this, university was for a very small sliver of the population. So about when I was going to, um, you know, finish up high school and go on to university, only about five or six percent of kids, uh, graduates, you know, high school leavers in the United Kingdom went on to college, onto a university. 
But for me, at the time that I was born in the 1960s, and you know, by the 1970s and 1980s, that opportunity to go to university had actually been opened up because the local education authority, the, the local state, um, gave grants, full grants, full scholarships, essentially, for people from low socioeconomic backgrounds of limited means to go to college, they paid for all of it. It's like the Pell Grants in the United States, or like the GI Bill opened all of this up for people after World War II. So on the one hand, the educational system didn't have a lot of expectations packed into it. On the other hand, it had also started to open up and give people opportunities because you would have a paid for education. So I was one of the, the few who got um, to go to university, that five or 6%, but I got everything paid for. So I didn't have to hesitate or think about whether I could go to university, I didn't have to take out loans. I actually had that opportunity to go to university. And the universities were also, to some of them, were kind of opening up the um, you know, educational requirements. Not Oxford and Cambridge, the elite universities at that time, the, the big two in the United States, but other universities were actually making it easier for people like myself to start to apply and to hope to get an entry. And you know, that for me is a very important lesson and message that I try to bring out in the book. That you know, people can only really get ahead, particularly in a place where there's low expectations, if there's that possibility to actually take advantage of an opportunity. Because I couldn't possibly, even if I'd passed all of the exams, which I had, have gone to university if there hadn't been some way to pay for it, because my parents couldn't pay for it. And there was no way that I could even contemplate taking out a loan. And you talked about your application to Oxford and basically being told you were out of your league. And that stuck with me because even as we wrestle in the United States with the costs of education for everyone, including community college, um, the elite universities seem to be ever further away uh, from the pocketbooks of the middle class. And in a sense, we're getting to the point where um, people who used to be able to go to elite universities now are out of their league when they try. So what was this experience like when you went for your interview? Well, there are all different aspects of this. I mean, you're absolutely right on the out of your league in terms of financing. Although in fact, a lot of the private universities like Harvard or Princeton or you know Yale, they actually have a lot of scholarships for people like me, for example, still. But, you know, a lot of people don't even know about it because when you're in a high school that is under-resourced in a place where it's lost its tax base because all of the industry is closed down, you know, your teachers are strapped for cash, you maybe don't have college counsellors, you know, your, your pa parents and your family are discouraging you from going to university and taking on loans or even applying for grants because, you know, they need you to go out there and get a job somewhere. You don't even know those opportunities are there. And that's actually part of the problem. This is the whole Oxford story. <clears throat> because my headmaster at my school wanted to show that somebody from my school, my background, could go to Oxford. And he asked me and a couple of other um, kids in my class to try to apply. But Oxford had an entrance exam. And at that time in the UK in the 1980s, people actually took special courses. Some people even sit on an extra year after school to prepare for the Oxford entrance exam. Nobody in my school had ever even seen this Oxford entrance exam. We had no idea what it entailed. The headmaster himself hadn't even seen it. And I kind of agreed because my parents said, why not? You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. And it was humiliating because, you know, basically it's the worst nightmare. It's the nightmare you take where, you know, it's that math class in elementary school or something or middle school that you didn't study for and you take the exam and you're looking at it and you have no idea what it means that was my experience it was the living nightmare and I looked at that exam and I thought well I can't answer any of these questions they were essay questions but they were about subjects I had no idea about people I'd never heard of because I'm in a school that doesn't prepare you for that kind of academic experiment and experience and so you know I failed the exam surprise surprise but I got a letter inviting me down for an interview. And then, you know, that was amazing because they obviously had looked you know, at my background, thought we'll give this girl a chance. But nobody explains to you what to expect under these circumstances. And so from people from a working class, blue collar, middle class background, you don't have the cultural awareness, the cultural capital, the training, the experience of the connections to know what you need to do in these cases. And so it was, you know, kind of one humiliation 
you know, really after another. And when I actually got to the interview at Oxford, I um, had a series of rather embarrassing experiences. And the professor who was interviewing me actually suggested that Oxford would not be for me and explained to me that I'd be much better off going to a kind of a place where I could study the things that I wanted to study and where I'd actually get um, a lot more opportunity. And he suggested St Andrews, which was already, you know, top of my list in Scotland. And I had a fantastic opportunity there. I really did. Even though it was also an elite university, they were just much more forthcoming in trying to kind of help people get over the hurdles. And there were the faculty, you know, were all much more, I would just say, gracious in their outreach and, you know, trying to kind of make people feel welcome and, you know, help them navigate things, which is what everybody needs. They need to help in navigating. Uh, it struck me that later in the book, you made the comparison uh, with poor communities in the US where even if young people get into a good university, they don't have the cultural background to navigate uh, in, the, in the way that you had to struggle to do. What also interested me, you did then go on to Harvard to study Russian and you found strong comparisons between the deindustrialization of Northern England and the situation here, which ultimately produced voters for President, ex-President Trump. Um, uh, and you mentioned that you, you went to carbon country in Pennsylvania. Um, what did you see there that made you say, oh my God, this is really you know, like Northwest England? You didn't know yet what results it was going to produce, but you saw the similarities. Yeah, I mean, the history of Carbon County, Pennsylvania, in the Lehigh Valley, and um, you know, basically County Durham in the north of England is the same. It was anthracite mining. And in fact, there was a lot of miners from north of England and Wales and Scotland and Ireland who came over to work in the Pennsylvania coal mines. And one of the little vignettes um, in the book, um, which of course, you know, um, really shaped some of my thinking is that in the 1960s when, you know, my dad's coal mine, he worked through several coal mines at this point, closed down. Mines in Pennsylvania, in Carbon County, in the Lehigh Valley were recruiting for miners uh, from the UK. And my dad wanted to go. And there was a, a number of mines that he actually explored. But my grandparents weren't well. He was looking after them. He was actually living with them and looking after them at the time. And he found he couldn't take them with him as his dependents. So he didn't go. And he always regretted it. Although the irony is, of course, that 10 years or more later, had he gone, the mines that he'd gone to work with in, in the Lehigh Valley would have closed as well. Oh, so, so. And so when I went to Carbon County, I went to Jim Thorpe, Pennsylvania, a friend of mine at Harvard. Um, who was in the you know studying Russian as well? That's where she was from. She was from Nesakonig, right next. I've probably murdered the translators of the um, inter, uh, what's the, the um, pronunciation of it, but basically right next door to Jim Thorpe, and she'd recommended you know kind of going and staying there for a weekend. She said you'll love it, and it's just like you know we've been talking the whole time about the parallels. And when I got there, I was like, this is this is it. This is basically County Durham transplanted to Pennsylvania. The scenery, I have to say, was much more beautiful in the Lehigh Valley and the scenic gorge. It was very rugged and, you know, really something striking. But it's the same thing. A, a, a whole county that had risen and fallen on anthracite mining and that had brought in immigrants, you know, from all over the world, including from my area. And that every historical building was tied to the mining uh, community. There was the Asa Packard um, mansion that was also tied to the railways, the development of ne nearby Lehigh University, all on the back of the industrialists who had basically prospered on anthracite mining and the railways and all of the other associated industries. And that was County Durham. I mean, in fact, in County Durham, people had been mining since the Romans were there. So, I mean, the whole history of mining in my county was even older, but the rise of prosperity was in the same time frame. And then the fall was very similar, though in Jim Thorpe, a lot of the mines closed down really early but one of the mines I think was the number nine mine in uh, Jim Thorpe was one of the ones that was recruiting when my dad was considering coming over to Pennsylvania so I was really struck even then and this is of course years before I start thinking about writing the book about how similar these experiences were of these regions and then I'm studying Russian and I get you know to Russia and I see the same similarities but on a much bigger scale than I'd seen at home or in you know kind of Pennsylvania 
in in deindustrialization after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Yeah, it was it was instantaneous. It was just overnight. All of the big factories and all of the big um, you know enterprises started to close down. I mean, the mines had to be propped up. Miners were going on strike just as they had in you know my home area. Coal mining, you know, wasn't going to come back in the same way. And, you know, people really struggling. You had mass unemployment in the 1990s, as you know, Trudy, because, you know, that's in the kind of period that you and I met each other when you were covering those developments there. And it's that mass unemployment, the failure to kind of bring in new industry, the failure for the education system and all of the, what I call in the book, the infrastructure of opportunity to adapt to a new uh, technological situation. I mean, basically, the, the whole economy, the world's economy and the local economy has moved on. And it's left everyone behind and people are in the same towns and cities and areas where their parents and their grandparents and their great grandparents were where they'd made lives and a lot of people didn't want to move but you know moving was the only prospect for a new opportunity in the soviet union people flooded out of all these old industrial towns and tried to go to moscow and obviously in the united states there's no one place to go no one moscow and it's very difficult to move in any case. It's extremely difficult for people to just uproot themselves and go to somewhere else, especially if they don't have the skills, they didn't have the educational qualifications and they don't know anyone somewhere else. Well, what struck me uh, was how you compared uh, these areas in, in Russia, uh, Britain and the US, looking at how the disaffection of people in these areas led uh, to support for populist leaders. Now, your hometown, uh, Bishop Auckland, was part of what was called the Red Wall in Britain, always voted Labour because of mining and unions. And suddenly the Red Wall broke and your town voted for Brexit, correct? And it voted for Boris Johnson and the Tories and sent a conservative member to parliament uh, for the first time and I don't know, maybe ever. A hundred years. Um, I mean, well, I mean, more than that, since 1889. Um, so the similarity <laughs> between the support in similar districts here for President Trump was very pronounced, right? And even the early support uh, for Vladimir Putin as a savior. Right. Um, yeah, that's exactly right, because people think that they've been let down. You know, and if you're waiting around for 50 years, you know, in the case of my hometown, you know, similar decades in the United States for new jobs to come back and, and, and to see, you know, the kind of the fabric of your towns and, um, you know, um, your homes and your neighborhoods just all crumbling away because there's nothing there. I mean, that really does, you know, kind of feed into frustration with the politics, but also despair about your own prospects. And there's so much research that's being done you know, right now about the deaths of despair in the United States, the white working class men and women who've lost their jobs, lost their livelihoods, lost their sense of well-being, and who you know, have um, you know, succumbed to um, you know, early death from cancer and from you know, all kinds of other morbidities and obviously the, the rise of substance abuse and alcoholism. And I saw the, exactly the same thing happening in the 1980s in the United Kingdom and in the 1990s in Russia. The sequencing is different in each place, but the phenomena are very striking, uh, are strikingly similar, kind of inescapable in a way, even though we know, of course, that Russia is a very different country with a very different history, that deindustrialization is very similar with similar effects. So why then, and you do discuss this in the book, but I'd like you to talk about it. Um, Knowing that Trump was part of this historical phenomenon, uh, looking towards populist leaders, why did you decide to work for him? Because the impetus at first in 2017 was about Russia itself. I mean, all the things that I've written about the book, I can't say that I was, you know, completely concentrated on when he was, um, you know, first elected. I mean, I knew, you know, the sources of people's grievances and why they found him popular as a charismatic leader saying I was going to fix things. I mean, the same thing had happened with Brexit in um, England. And I'd seen members of my family and my neighbours and my friends and in my town vote for Brexit because they wanted to bring back control. They wanted to get rid of Brussels that they saw as paying no attention to them. 
they were uh, disaffected with the Labour Party, even though many of them were members. And, you know, it was it was unimaginable that they'd vote in a different way because the Labour Party had let them down, just like people felt the Democrats had let them down. They'd done nothing for them in all these decades. So it was obvious, you know, what the motivations were there. But I was really worried in 2017, um, you know, when I agreed to go in by what had happened in 2016 with the Russian influence operation. You know, because you and I, Trudy, have been focused on Mr. Putin, the operative in the Kremlin, as I wrote this book, and you the first person to ask who was Mr. Putin when he came into office in 2000. You know, so I'm somebody who's been fixated on who is this guy and what are the Russian intelligence services done? I've been the intelligence officer in the US government trying to, you know, figure out, um, you know, how we were going to deal with all of these uh, efforts by the Russian security services to you know, carry out subversive activities. And I'd seen you know, very clearly what the Russians were up to in terms of launching a very sophisticated influence operation in the elections in 2016. And I wanted to do something about it. You know, I thought that I could help to mitigate this, to help you know, push back against what they'd done and to try to make sure that they couldn't do it again. And I was imagining that I would be working behind the scenes in the government with a lot of the people I'd worked with previously in the government under other public service efforts that I'd undertaken. And I was there under both the Bush and the Obama administration, you know, doing a transition. You know, I thought that that was, you know, something that I could try to do again. I felt like our house was on fire, you know, with the Russians intervening and I could do something. Of course, very quickly, once I get inside, I figure out that you know the Russians are the half of it. The real problem is what's happening in our domestic politics. And you know, I knew more about the Kremlin and Kremlin politics. I knew about White House politics. And let's just say, any naivety, any skills over my eyes were pr pretty much you know quickly dispelled. And I realized that I was in a very similar situation to the kind of place that I was writing about when I was writing about Russia, the Kremlin, and all of the machinations and intrigues. Um Talk a little bit about that and tell us about the shoes incident, the sneakers, um, and, and uh, it, what this quickly revealed to you about President Trump's interest or disinterest in expert advice on a subject like Russia. Well, look, this is a you know, fairly um, silly kind of story and you know, uh, one that I'm sure a lot of people can relate to. You know, every day, body's you know first day on the job doesn't always go too well. You know, as I relate in the book, um, my daughter had um, got food poisoning the night before I was supposed to start at the white at the White House. She'd thrown up all night, thrown up on me. I'd gone out to try to you know get her some Gatorade, and I'd bashed my face with the car door, giving myself a black eye, and I was so befuddled because I hadn't slept a wink all night when I was going out um, in the morning to what I thought was going to be the first orientation session at the at the White House. I put my sneakers on to run to the metro. I certainly didn't trust myself driving after being awake all night. And I ran to the metro and I was all the way into the White House and I realized, ah, oh, my shoes. I'd left my dress shoes behind. Every woman's nightmare. <laughs> Actually, men's nightmare as well, if you've left your dress shoes behind. And so, you know, I get in there, I thought, well, it'll be okay, it'll be fine. I mean, you know, I'm gonna do all of this and I'm probably gonna go home. But of course, that didn't happen. I'd only been in the orientation session for about an hour when somebody came and plucked me out because there'd been a terrorist attack on the St. Petersburg Metro that day. I'd missed it completely because I'd been you know, up with my daughter and I hadn't checked the news or anything. And I'd been in locked doors listening to orientations about the White House computer systems. And someone saying, you've got to come over because President Trump wants to call President Putin for a condolence call. You'll need to give him something to say. And of course, you know, I'm like, oh my God, first of all, what, what happened? And then it's, I haven't got any shoes and I'm gonna go into the awful office wearing a pair of black sneakers. I tried on some shoes in the General McMaster, the National Security um, Advisor's uh, office from some of the women he worked with. They didn't fit because my feet were too big. So he said, just come on in the Oval Office, stick the shoes under the desk. He's not gonna really look up, which was true. He didn't, he didn't even pay any attention to me at all. It'll be fine. I told the president the two things that I had the presence of mind to say. First of all, this is the first attack in the St. Petersburg Metro. This is Putin's hometown. It's gonna be very personal for him. There'd been you know, terrorist attacks in Moscow before, but not St. Petersburg, so it's a big deal. That's essentially kind of what Trump said, this would have been a big deal for you, personal, your hometown, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, okay, fine, I can escape, go back. Nothing terrible has happened. And then Ivanka Trump came in, sat down beside me 
And at first of all, I thought, what? What's she doing here? And then looked at my shoes. Oh my goodness, there's this woman with big black sneakers on <laughs> sitting in front of the Resolute desk. And I was like, oh my goodness. And then I realized quite quickly, this is a family affair. You know, so she is just, you know, walks in uh, unannounced, although, you know, she's his daughter, yes, but she's also supposed to be a special advisor. And this was a pattern right from the beginning that Trump was running the whole show as a family affair, as an extension of, you know, what he had done in the past with his Trump family business. And on many occasions, Ivanka and Jared, her husband, would be in meetings that I was in that did, were not part of their portfolios, they were just there. And Trump would ask them, rather than anyone else, well, what did you think of the call? How did it sound? You know, was that, was that good? Uh, and you wrote about prom night um, when Ivanka was there about the dress code. Yeah, it was, you know, very glamorous. And, you know, the, the, the tone for dress in the West Wing was set by Ivanka Trump and also by Fox News. I mean, if anyone's seen the movie Bombshell uh, about Fox News, that was kind of, you know, the whole dress style. And I immediately felt, you know, completely out of place, not just from you know, running around in my sneakers, but I actually did feel compelled to go out and buy a few dresses just so I wouldn't stand out because, you know, you kind of immediately look at, looked at, it's like being, you know, back in middle school or high school where if you don't have a school uniform, people are looking at you for, you know, what you're wearing. Do you conform to the, to the code, you know, to the way, you know, that uh, they're expecting everyone to look. So it was immediately kind of a jarring experience. I mean, you know, I write a lot about in the book about how clothes, the way you dress, the way you look, particularly for a woman, shape the way that people judge you and how they interact with you. And that was kind of an immediate, you know, right off the bat, um, you know, revelation, realization that um, this was really going to matter a lot. And I wasn't going to get in and out and do my job if I didn't look the part. And he, anyway, uh, I mean, as we learned later and as I learned and that tweet just underscores, I never imprinted on Trump. He never really kind of saw me as anything other than a middle aged woman, you know, who um, a deep state stiff, as he put it. I was even surprised, actually, that he said he noticed the accent because I wasn't even <laughs> completely convinced that he had. <laughs> well, uh, you write a lot about uh, Trump's disinterest in expertise, uh, and, and including in any serious briefing about Putin himself, his motivation, and you had written a whole book about Putin, you had sat next to him at a major conference in, um, in Moscow. Um, he was never interested in that, right? No, not at all. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure his view was, what, what can she tell me about Putin? And, you know, it wasn't this that I'd written a book. I'd been going there on a regular basis since 1987. In fact, I knew an awful lot of the people around Putin. Some of them I'd studied with in university. I mean, there's some pretty, you know, key people in the Russian government who I knew personally since I was in my 20s. I'd been basically going back in there for you know 30 plus years. But, you know, that was irrelevant because, you know, I wasn't the CEO of a major company. You know, I wasn't a billionaire. I wasn't a beauty queen. I wasn't on Fox News. And, you know, un unfortunately, as many of us, you know, have learned by watching this all very closely. I mean, you know, some of my insights, everybody's got those same insights. Trump was very much swayed by who he thought his peer group were. If someone was on Fox News and as a news anchor and, you know, getting his attention, expertise for him was really just here and there. He didn't see the point of it. And also as the, and I actually heard him say this uh, in my presence, of course, you know, not noticing that, you know, I or most of the people are there, that he believed that, you know, having been so successful in his uh, private business, that there wasn't anything else he needed to learn from anyone else. He said it repeatedly. He often said, you know, I know more than my generals. I know more than this person. I know more than that person. You know, I, I, I don't need to hear from them. He never read his briefings in full. He did listen to the intel briefers and when the CIA director, Gina Haspel, and you know, some of his other briefers came over, he would listen to them. But and, and the other issues, he, he'd much prefer to get his information from Fox News or a personal friend or from another strongman leader that he really admired. And so Putin, Xi, Erdogan of Turkey, Xi of China, that is, um, Erdogan of Turkey, uh, you know, you name it who was a prominent leader or a major industrial private uh, enterprise billionaire figure, he would more listen to them than he would to anyone else because those for him were his peers, not his staff, 
not the members of his cabinet. And in fact, once you started to work for him, he started to discount you and disregard you entirely. What did Trump want from Putin? Who, who did, what did he see in Putin? Um, and did you ever believe that Putin had something on Trump or was he just a master manipulator? Putin. Well, Putin is a master manipulator, but President Trump is remarkably easy to manipulate. And I think very sadly, the fact that he had to issue a statement about me today realizes that. Normal circumstances, people would ignore criticism. They wouldn't feel like they need to rise to the bait, to, to the bait about it. And I talk about in the book about how President Trump effectively had a nasty list. He would talk about this. He would, you know, make sure that um, people kept track of nasty things that people said about him to make sure that he could get his revenge on them at some point in some way or another, call them out. Or if they were a foreign leader, they wouldn't meet with them or, you know, any other kind of key person. But then he was unbelievably susceptible to flattery. And the first thing that Trump, um, you know, kind of wanted to hear from world leaders was, were they going to be nice to him? In fact, the only thing that he actually asked me about Putin was, was he a nice man? Am I going to like him? Which I thought was a really you know, bizarre thing, you know, to, to really ask, because of course he's not a nice man. And like isn't part of the issue, is it? Because it's how you're going to be able to deal with him. Are you going to be able to work with him when you're at the level of the president of the United States? But Trump also always wanted to know, did someone like him respect him? Remember, he talked about Kim Jong-un and the exchange of love letters. He was obsessed about President Xi and how President Xi thought about him, even though he was pretty antagonistic towards China. It wasn't about their countries or the relationship. When he was looking at them, he was trying to see the reflection of himself in them, because these are people that he wanted to be like, and he wanted to be recognized as being in their company. The strong man, the super rich, the super powerful the person who can get everybody to do what they want. And he says this openly and repeatedly. So what Putin had was this knowledge that Trump had a fragile ego and that he could be very easily manipulated. And a classic example that I relate in the book. And again, I'm trying to put this in the context of populism and the kind of leaders that you get out of these populist circumstances, was that Putin praised Trump for the performance of the economy in the stock market on Russian television it was picked up on Fox News and on the other US press. And immediately Trump wanted to call Putin. That's what Putin wanted. Because at this point, Putin wanted to show that he had, you know, basically the American president calling him and treating him as an equal, you know, for different you know, sets of reasons. But this was a great triumph for Putin, a very easy triumph. He got Trump to call him, even though of course, the press in the US was all over Trump every time he called Putin because they all thought that he was the Moscow candidate, that he was being manipulated in a different way by Putin, when really he was being manipulated on just this, you know, surface level of Putin knowing how to push his buttons to get him to, you know, do what he wanted. It wasn't about blackmail or, you know, kind of holding anything over uh, Trump other than Putin seeming to like him and to respect him and to, you know, talk about him in favorable terms. I mean, I found that really disturbing at the same time as I recognize it right away because it was a counterintelligence risk. It's not, you know, what we all think that, you know, Putin might have had on Trump. If he can be that easily manipulated, we're in enormous trouble. Um, I'm going to turn to some questions now. Uh, and one that has come in asks, it has been argued that the extension of NATO into Eastern Europe involved an overreach and worsened Russian relations with the West, especially since Russia is more of a regional than a world power. How do you see this? And obviously we know that this is one of the scabs that Putin continually picks at. Well, certainly, I mean, that is Putin's view that it was, um not just an overreach, was actually a threat to Russia and to Russian interests. And, you know, look, I have to say, you know, in my earlier, you know, phases of my career, you know, when I was, um, you know, starting out, I actually did not think it was advisable to enlarge NATO. But, you know, who was I at that point? I was, you know, a graduate student, um, you know, Harvard, doing my work. I was, you know, working as a research assistant to one of the professors there, Graham Ollis, and I wasn't actually in a position to particularly speak out about that. But, you know, some, you know, more prominent people 
who you know I work with very closely. I mean, George Kennan, the famous um, you know, US diplomat who wrote um, the long telegram about dealing with Russia, didn't think NATO enlargement was a great idea. Professor Pipes, who was my thesis advisor for my PhD, is pretty famous. He'd actually held the job that I later had in the National Security Council under the Reagan era. He actually also didn't think, interestingly enough, that expanding NATO was particularly advisable because he thought that it would provoke a backlash from, uh, from Russia. And so, you know, that was actually how it um, how it played out. Now, I think one of the turning points in Putin's very negative attitude toward NATO came in 1999, when NATO um, bombed, I mean, it was really a you know, US operation, but in the framework of NATO, bombed Belgrade during the um, standoff over Kosovo, which you, Trudy, of course, you know, covered. And I was happened to be in St. Petersburg at the time for a conference. And there were many Russian, um, liberal uh, politicians there who were you know kind of there at the forefront of you know, trying to expend expand rather Russian democracy and democratization and they all said what a disaster at the time that this would just kind of close the door for um, the further expansion of US Russian relations and in fact contract the space in which we all had to kind of operate on and trying to improve the relationship because even for them this seemed like a very aggressive action of showing that NATO was still a military alliance that was targeted against Russia and its allies, because at that point Russia was supporting Serbia in the region, not necessarily in you know, the kind of committing of genocide against um, Kosovars. But it was all looked at in that whole Cold War context. And it was obvious that any further expansion of NATO, you know, in the 2000s after that, um, incidents um, of, uh, it wasn't just an incident, of course, it was a major uh, a development of the shelling of Belgrade by NATO planes was gonna be looked at in a very harsh and very negative light. And so, you know, just as the questioner is surmising, that expansion of NATO really kind of created a frame, an antagonistic frame for people like Putin and others you know, to basically react against. Um, if we have a question. Uh, about a little more about Trump's modus operandi in in, in the in the White House, uh, you you talk a lot about the chaotic aspect of the way the White House operated. Um, this questioner wants to know uh, when Trump spoke privately with Putin and grabbed the translator's notes. Did anyone know what he really said? Um, and uh, uh, is he exchanging anything uh, derogatory or uh, not helpful to the United States? So we do know what was said. And that incident took place in Hamburg at the G20. And Trump and Putin were not alone at that particular meeting. There were the translators there, but also Rex Tillerson, who was the Secretary of State at the time, was there, along with Sergei Lavrov, his counterpart, the Russian Foreign Minister. So there were other people in the room, and Secretary Tillerson took notes, and President Trump did not take his notes. And the translators' notes are not particularly useful because they're usually just sort of shorthand um, that are written down as a prompt for the translator to be able to say you know, kind of what's, or translate what's said next in a sentence. The translator told me and another colleague what he recalled from the um, conversation. And Secretary Tillerson gave me and several other people uh, basically a blow by blow from his own um, handwritten notes. And he was the CEO of ExxonMobil. So, you know, he had a pretty good recall. He's a very professional person. And he'd met with Vladimir Putin on numerous occasions. So you weren't really going to pull a fast one on Rex Tillerson. So, you know, he was kind of well aware of where there might have been some pitfalls in the conversation. And, you know, he followed up on everything. And he actually gave a press conference afterwards in which he related pretty much everything that was said there. But, you know, what was more problematic was the way in which Trump interacted with people. And, it's, you know, the kind of fact is kind of the conversation that he had with them was the same conversation he might have on Twitter, for example, the same sort of style or the same kind of conversation he might have you know, with a guy on the street. He didn't really modulate the way that he had interactions, you know, to factor in there that he's meeting with the president 
of a country, Russia, that has been, you know, pretty much confrontational towards the United States. You just talked with them like you would talk to anybody else in the lobby of Mar-a-Lago, for example. That was the problem. We're not really kind of the content of what he said, but just the whole way that he conducted these conversations. Including at the press conference in Helsinki. Well, that was, you know, the, the, the ultimate debacle. But before that, in the meeting with um, Putin and Trump, which went on for a while, again, with translators there, and you have to remember that Vladimir Putin speaks in great big long sentences and full paragraphs and has to be translated. So a lot of the time is taken up by the translation, which is, you know, after um, the, um, you know, the long diatribe or exposition by Putin, depending on what he's talking about. Putin also speaks English. He's been learning English, you know, sufficient a level of English to understand exactly what President Trump is saying, because President Trump isn't speaking in long, large sentences. He's just kind of mostly listening and then you know, basically speaking back again. And that takes a lot less time to translate. But, you know, Putin's already got it anyway. But that meeting in Helsinki behind the scenes was fairly straightforward, apart from Putin trying to pull several fast ones, which the interpreter immediately told everybody about and we were able to follow up on. But it was the press conference that was the real disaster because President Trump didn't want to be shown up in front of Putin because Putin was his peer. And when the media asked him about the in Russian interference in the election, he didn't want to answer that question. He never did because he thought it was best being asked, go on, President Trump, admit you're not legitimate. Admit that this guy here, Vladimir Putin, elected you, not the people of the United States. And of course, he wasn't going to say anything along those lines. It kind of pushed all of his buttons. And then he didn't want to actually have to dis Putin in front of Putin, because his idea is he's, he's having this, you know, bonding session with his fellow strongman. And he doesn't want to be humiliated. And, you know, he wants all of this. He wants to be praised in front of Putin. And that's not what happened. And of course, he lost it. And he lost the plot. He lost the thread. And he ends up, you know, turning himself all over, trying to avoid the question, trying to get it back into his favorite, you know, terms of like throwing it back on other people and conspiracy theories and ends up, as we all heard, by basically giving Putin the benefit of the doubt over his own intelligence services. It was an absolute mess, but it was entirely predictable, entirely predictable. And, you know, when President Biden met with Putin that first time in Geneva, he very sensibly did not have a joint press conference. Uh, there's a question about how frightened should the average American be for the next election? Are there any reasons for optimism? And I would like to tie that in with a couple of the major points you make in the book. Uh, you talk about Trump's admiration for autocrats, and you've mentioned it tonight. Uh, you saw it not just with Putin, but with Erdogan, with Xi, and with Hungary's Viktor Orban. Um, so if you're talking about the future, Tell us a little about what you saw in the past in the White House and heard from the president about autocrat envy and what we might project if he were to run and be elected again. Yeah, I'll start with that point because President Trump openly praised um, autocrats. He repeatedly said that um, he would love to have basically the situation, as he would put it, they had. In other words, no checks and balances, the ability to potentially stay in power indefinitely, and you know, basically the opportunity to do as he liked in terms of appointments, essentially running America like his own private business, like that family business theme that you I saw. You heard him earlier. saying things like I mean, We've all heard him say it. He said it in public. I mean, people right. can just go I on understand. and look at his Twitter feed. I mean, yeah, I heard him. He's not a lot different in private than he is in public. That is, you know, reason that we should be very concerned because he means it. It is not a joke. People say in a joking fashion things that they mean when they're deadly serious. He would do that to kind of test to see how people push back. And when they didn't, he would plow on. Other world leaders who were not demagogues recognize that. And, you know, some of them called him out on it as well. But the American you know, body politic isn't calling him out in the way that it should. He is not a Republican. Let's just put it out there. He used to be a Democrat. He doesn't have any ideology. He has managed to capture one of the main parties in this country, the Republican Party, and turn it into a charismatic cult around himself. 
And until people stand up and actually realize what's happening, that he's been duping people. I mean, he was legitimately elected. He, you know, managed to talk to people directly and tell them he was going to fix things for them, but he was actually only really going to fix things for himself. Until people realize that he's selling them, you know, as my granddad would have said, a, a pig in a poke, basically, you know, kind of, I, I think there's an American expression, something like that about, you know, you think that you're buying something valuable, but you're actually getting, you know, something, you know, that's quite contrary to what you're expecting, hidden in a, in a sack. I mean, this is, you know, basically, he's pulling a fast one on everybody here. Until people realize that and stand up for themselves, remember, you know, members of Congress, that they took an oath to the Constitution, that they promised to serve their constituents, all of them, you know, not just those who voted for them, and that the preamble to the American Constitution, everything was talked about in Philadelphia, you know, back in the days, of we, the people. We fetishize the presidency and we're allowing one man to capture it all again. We're on a path, you know, that, you know, we wouldn't have foreseen, you know, hundreds of years ago. I mean, the founding fathers did foresee the risk of tyranny, but they didn't see it playing out in this way where one person could capture a party and try to refashion it in um, their image. I mean, he was trying to effect, in a way, a merger and acquisition with the United States and turn it, turn it into an extension of Trump enterprises. And I mean, I saw all of this, we're all seeing this. So unless people get out there and they tell the truth, he did not win the election in 2020. But there's a great risk that he will come back and win in 2024 by, you know, all kinds of machinations here. And in fact, he says that he's the rightful president still, that he ought to be in office. He's been, you know, basically asking people for recounts of votes all over the place. It doesn't matter that they haven't found, you know, any of the evidence that supports his um, proposition here. He's going to turn the whole country in knots to get back into power. And once he's in power, he's made it clear he has no intention of staying and that maybe he wants to have a member of his family to succeed him. We're seeing this all over the world. We never thought that we would see it in America. In the Philippines, we've just heard that Duterte is going to step down. But who is he favouring for the next president? His daughter. I mean, actually, interesting enough, in Russia, Vladimir Putin's family have all disappeared into, you know, very rich and wealthy, um, you know, obscurity in the background. I mean, he hides them, but you know, we know now from all these revelations, these new papers, Pandora papers, they've all got, you know, lovely apartments in Monaco and, you know, all living very nicely. But he isn't kind of saying that he's going to create a, di a dynasty. It's kind of ironic, right? But here in the United States, we're talking about dynasties again. I mean, this is what we should be concerned about. Look, the only way to change this, and again, this isn't about partisan politics, this is about all of us here, is to go out there and tell the truth about what's happening. Because this is not America first, this is one man first. And it's deeply disturbing, and this is demagoguery. This is not just populism. This is the path to autocracy. And this is not where, when we started, when we had the Congress of the States in Philadelphia. I mean, we're about to have, you know, of our, another of our centenaries coming up. I mean, is this what we're gonna to do to this country? Anyway, I mean, I know I'm sounding very passionate about it, but I'm an immigrant. I came here 30 years ago, not just for opportunity, but because of what America stood for. It stood for the truth and it stood for hope. And we're throwing all of that away. In your book, you write a lot about what you think needs to be done to address the needs of people who have turned to populists and demagogues because of dissatisfaction, cultural, economic, uh, uh, with uh, their lives, um, their economic situation or changes in demography. I'm curious, do you think that those changes can, uh, can head off the rise, the, the continued rise of populism in this country, in Britain? I won't even get to Russia because it's a different situation. Right. Um, and what are some of the key areas that you think must be addressed uh, uh, and do you think the Biden administration is heading in that direction? 
Well, look, I do think that this um, infrastructure and reconciliation bill has all the right elements there because, you know, <laughs> it looks like it's going to be impossible to pass. Because I don't think that the kind of public policy ideas, the things that we need to do to fix it are a big mystery. I think everybody could come up with a list. I mean, I've come up with, you know, sort of ideas in the book. They're not that original because we all know what it takes. It's going to be very hard work. The politics aren't there. It's the political will, the capacity for collective action. And that's where, you know, the, the real rub is here. Because, you know, we're all going to have to take some personal responsibility for this. It took generations for things to turn around in a rather negative way, and it's going to take a long time to fix things. And that's why populism is so attractive, because it promises quick fixes, quick solutions to things that you know, are very complex and very difficult. So it's gonna be very hard to take the edge off it. What we need to do is find some demonstration projects to really kind of try to show to people that we can do things. And you know, I'm advocating a lot of things in the book that are grassroots, that are local. There was something that just happened you know, last week in, in Philadelphia. There was a big, I don't know whether any of the people who were listening tonight saw this, there was a big um, opening of the Arlen Spectre um, big squash center. And I got invited along to this by a group in Portland, Maine, Portland Community Squash, because I've been very interested in some of the work that they've been doing after you know, getting in touch with them for a variety of reasons. And this is just this amazing effort, grassroots effort of people living in Portland, Maine with some inspirational leadership to try to create a big community project through squash, bringing in kids from elementary and middle school all the way through to high school and their families funding them for all of these after school curriculum programs centered around squash mentoring them creating transportation for them to get home you know after the uh, activities and from school there and they're trying to take this whole idea national and it's bringing in kids from all kinds of socioeconomic and immigrant uh, backgrounds you know, from a place in Portland, Maine, that like many places in Pennsylvania or like in the Northeast of England, lost the mainstays of its economy. And it's just a real effort to show that you can actually do something for your community. And it has a lot of political um, application as well, because it's giving people hope. And it's giving all these kids a kind of a sense of pride in themselves and their community. And they're taking it national. And they're, you know, trying to do things in Philadelphia as well. Look, this kind of thing with the free library, what do libraries do? Libraries provide knowledge. Libraries also provide opportunity. When I was a kid, there was a citizen's advice bureau in my local library, and they would give you advice on things that you could do. They told me about scholarships. They would help me find books for my school that I couldn't otherwise find. They were often you know, retirees or professional people who had really made it in life. And these are the kinds of things that we could do. You know, in the absence of people getting their act together at the top, we can get our acts together and tie all of these things together at the bottom and show them that, hey, look, things can be done here. And those kinds of shared projects, you know, you can play squash, nobody's gonna ask you if you're a Democrat or Republican. When you go to a library, they don't say, can you show me your party card and see what your affiliation is? This is free and open to the public and we can you know, send a message this way. We've got to get beyond these parties and politics. I think that's the perfect note on, on which to end. Um, and I am very pleased to say that if you want to hear more from Fiona Hill, I will be doing an Inquirer live discussion with her also on the book and on Russia on Friday, November 19th at 11 a.m. Uh, so thanks very much, Fiona. Thanks to the audience and the Free Library. And I look forward to talking to you more. Thanks so much, Trudy. And thanks to everyone as well for joining tonight. Thank you so much.